we start by speaking to Paul Barber, OBE no less as well. Congratulations, welcome Thanks. to the show. Goodness me, uh, very busy. You have completed this British transfer record, a £115 million deal to sell Moises Caicedo to Chelsea. Now, what does it mean to the club? Well, I think, first of all, we've lost a fantastic player and that's going to be a challenge for us to replace him. I think probably at this stage in his career, he's irreplaceable, so it's going to be difficult. But it was a, a, a good moment in time for us to, 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 to sell uh, Moises mm. and obviously we've achieved a British record transfer fee, so it gives us an opportunity to reinvest that money going forward. What's been the reaction at the club? To, to losing such a great player? Well, I think because of the speculation in the January mm. window, we were always conscious that this could happen in the summer. So I think we've been prepared for that. Obviously, we're always disappointed to lose a good player, but I think we've got a great squad and we've started the season well. So mm. we're looking ahead, not back. Well, that's, I guess, what you have to do. But it's been a bit of a tricky deal to be done because obviously the talks didn't start with Chelsea, did they? Tell us about the process and how long you've had to have these discussions and how it works with you know, agents getting involved, players maybe wanting a different decision to the one that you initially thought you were going to be doing with a different club, of course. Yeah, well, first of all, I think you always want competition for your players. If you're in a position where you are going to sell, then having competition is good because obviously mm. it enables you to negotiate much harder. Um, Chelsea were interested from the start. Liverpool were interested sort of towards the end of the, of the process. Um, there was other interest in Moises as well. But in the end, our job is to stay focused and to get the best possible price for our player. And of course, you have to listen to the players' wishes as well, necessarily. They might change and just, there are different factors in a, in a deal like this, aren't there? I think also, yeah, when, when a player has been targeted during a period of time and his mind is set on going in one particular place and another opportunity comes mm. up, obviously he will want time to consider that. But ultimately, Ultimately, where the player wants to go is a factor in the process and we have to be respectful of that but at the same time we have to do what's right for our club as well. When were you aware of both Liverpool and Chelsea's interest? Well, Chelsea were interested all the way through uh, the summer, Liverpool a bit later um, but you know we try and do our transfer business as confidentially as possible. We try yeah. and respect both the player and the clubs that are bidding um, but at the end of the day our job is to, to do the best for our club um, and that means negotiating as hard as we can when we're in that position. Yeah, and Liverpool, they were the first to agree, and it was a record fee as well, these are huge figures we're talking about. Talk us through the negotiations for him with Liverpool. Well, they're, t they're tough negotiations. You know, I think when you're dealing at any level of the transfer market, but particularly the top end, you know, everyone is looking to create the best position for themselves. And in our case, we had a, an asset that was very important to our club, probably one of the best midfield players currently in Europe, potentially one of the best midfield players in the world. We didn't want to lose him. We had him on a long contract and we were simply looking to make sure that we achieve the best possible price. And that means, as I say, negotiating hard with whichever club comes in for him. And how quickly then before you realised actually Caicedo turned them down, his, his head was turned, as you'd mentioned, other factors coming into this. Did it then put the club in a bit of a difficult position because you're having to deal with one and try and keep your relationship strong with other clubs when you've negotiated and you've come to an agreement together in, in, in the right way yeah. to then have to pull out of the deal and then start the discussions with, with another club to try and keep everybody happy? It's difficult. It's not the ideal situation because you, you know, we agreed a, a, a price with Liverpool. We agreed a transfer a, agreement with them. Mm. At that point, we have to hand over to the player and his agent to try and agree personal terms. When that process starts to break down, then, of course, we have to revert back to what's best for Brighton. And that's what we did. We were respectful for, to Liverpool for as long as it was viable that the player would go there. As soon as we were aware that that wasn't going to be his choice, then we had to switch our attentions mm. and to try and get the best possible price from, from Chelsea as well. Yeah. yeah. How do you make sure it doesn't damage your relationship with Liverpool having had such successful discussions with them? I think by being honest and open and transparent. I mean, you know, there is only so much we can do to... Um, get that transfer completed mm. at the end of the day you know there are three signatures on a contract in this country the two clubs and the player as well and, and from that point of view the player does have a say in where he ultimately wants to play his football going forward so we will be respectful to the to the club that's we've agreed to transfer mm. with for as long as we can but as soon as we're aware that that transfer isn't going to proceed then of course we've got to turn our attentions and protect our own interests going forward yeah absolutely at what point did you realize the deal then was like oh gosh this isn't going to happen here, is it? And then you have to negotiate a deal with Chelsea instead. Well, after 48 hours of 
tough negotiating. Mm. Um, it's quite demoralising to have to think you've yeah. got to do it all over again. But that's the job. And, um, you know, towards the back end of last week, I think it became apparent that it, it almost certainly wasn't going to happen mm. with Moises and Liverpool. And at that, at that point, we had to engage with Chelsea and, and try and agree a deal with them. Yeah, I mean, we remember back in January, uh, Caicedo, he refused to play because he did want a move away from the club. He wanted to play for Chelsea. Was that the right thing to do? I mean, how did you manage that situation? Well, we managed it by just giving him some time off, yeah. just giving him a chance to sort of go away, clear his head. And I think at that point, you know, you are relying on the players' professionalism, obviously. You're, you're relying on good advice, um, but you're also relying on us being sensible. He's a young man. Yeah. He's 21 years of age. Um, he's, you know, facing a massive decision. Mm. And I think in that situation, as a club, we've got a responsibility to to do what's right for us, but also to try and help the player as much as we can. We want young players to keep coming to us. And if we treat them well, we look after them, we try and guide them through these difficult situations, we've got more chance of that happening in the future, which is good for our club and not bad for our club, than if we just simply allow the situation to escalate out of control. Yeah, very true. Now how much of this huge transfer fee, £115 million, will be reinvested into the team? How, how do you look at that money and decide where, where it's going to go? If I told you that, hey, you're making my job even harder going <laughs> forward. But, um, but of course, we, we want to make sure the squad is as strong as it can be for Roberto. We've already done quite a lot of business early in this window, yeah. so you know, we're already slightly ahead of the game. But we'll only invest that money to strengthen the squad if we're able to strengthen the squad. We're not just simply going to go out and spend the money because we've got it. And that's an important part of our model. We try and bring in players before we need them. And then when we're in a position to sell, then we're not going back out to the market with lots of money in our pocket. Um, that's not a model that's perfect. We're not mm. geniuses. It's not an exact science. But that's what we try and do in every transfer window. We try and get players in before we need them so that we're in a better position to sell. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the owner, Tony Bloom, he's, I mean, he's invested hundreds of millions of pounds into the club. Will some of the money from the Kaiseido do you actually go back to him? Ultimately, that's Tony's call. I mean, he's been mm. incredibly generous from the day he took over the club. Um, you know, we've built the stadium, thanks to Tony. We've yeah. built a world-class training ground, thanks to Tony. We've been able to invest in the squad that's got us all the way through to the Premier League, thanks to Tony. So, you know, if he wanted to take some money back uh. at some point, of course, you know, that would be something that he'd be more than entitled to do. But going forward, his ambition gets higher every year and we need to sort of realise that ambition for him and keep working towards the aims that we have. Yeah, and of course, it's a business. Football is a business and it works in complicated ways. I guess for the fans, it's just like, who are we getting to replace Kaisejo? How do you even look at doing that? You've got the money to do that now. As you mentioned, you have signed players already, but are there players on your radar now, now that you know that the deal's done, the money is there, you know, that the fans will be wanting some sort of replacement of sorts? Well, we start from the position of having a great squad. So there are players already that can, that, that can step into Moise's position, but where we can strengthen the squad, we'll certainly look to do that. But it's not something that we're going to rush around to do unless the player is right and the price is right. I don't think I ever thought I'd be sitting here discussing, you know, deals over a hundred million pounds. But football, it moves. Money talks. Uh, we're seeing huge figures as well. There's Saudi Arabian deals that we're learning about that they're almost mind blowing at the moment. What do you make of this summer's, I guess, transfer market in, in general? Do you feel prices are inflated? It, it feels like they are, um, and there might be a number of reasons for that. I think possibly Saudi Arabia has had a, an impact to some degree, although you know we haven't seen the very biggest players move there just yet. But it's you know any competition to the Premier League mm. where our best talent is moving to a different league is is competition we've got to be cognizant of and we've got to be respectful of. But at the moment, yes, prices are quite high. But I think that's, again, teams are ambitious. Everybody wants to win. Everybody wants to progress in their particular position, whether that's winning titles, winning Champions Leagues, or just simply moving further up the table and away from relegation areas. So mm -hmm. that natural competition is always going to fuel, to some degree, mm -hmm. uh, the value of players in a market like this. I just want to mention financial fair play, because if there's that to consider as well, we've got Chelsea continuing to spend huge amounts on, on transfer fees, despite these FFP uh, you know, rules being in place. What do you think of that? Are the rules robust enough, in your opinion? Well, I mean, that's something for the Premier League to look at, not, not individual clubs. But mm. certainly from our point of view, you know, we want the, the playing field to be as level as possible. We want the league to be as competitive and as compelling as possible. We want teams to go out every week 
uh, with their fans knowing that they've got a fair chance of winning. If mm. all the players are, are ending up in a very small number of clubs and that competition is eroded in some way, uh, then we're potentially damaging our own products. So certainly we want FFP rules to be robust. We want them to ensure that that competitive and compelling football continues long into the future.